deciding when to use generics versus inheritance in your game systems can feel overwhelming. The good news, many times the best solution is to use both. So let's break down when to use inheritance and when to choose generics and when to combine them. Then walk through refactoring a game system, transforming it from a hard-coded monolith into an extensible modular design that leverages both inheritance and one of C Sharp's most powerful features, generics. Let's get started. I thought I'd throw an example up here that we're gonna refactor from later in this video. In this example of beginner code, there's a unique method for handling every possible loot drop scenario. So for example, in the first method, it's going to drop loot from a chest and have a different chance of dropping loot based on whether or not it's a dungeon or something else. It's hard coded all of the items that are going to be dropped. And if we were to expand on this, we're going to have to have a sequence of if else statements. Very quickly, it's going to spiral out of control. Not only that, but the callers have to have a reference to this loot system and know the exact method to call. This scenario is the perfect opportunity to refactor to a combination of inheritance and generics. But first, let's go over when you would want to use inheritance or generics or both. Let's start with generics. So generics are ideal when you want this same functionality applied to various types and it will always be implemented the same way. Imagine you're designing a game inventory system to store different types of items, health potions, weapons, or armor. A generic inventory allows you to maintain the same functionality like add, remove, or count across all item types. In this example, I haven't put any constraints on what T can be, so this can be an inventory of anything. For example, we could have an inventory of only health potions, or we could have one that's just for weapons. Without generics, you might be forced to create separate classes for each type of inventory or rely on a less type safe approach like a collection of objects that requires constant type checking and casting. With generics, you define the behavior of your inventory system once and make it adaptable to any type. So how is this different than inheritance? Well, inheritance is useful when you want to reuse the same functionality, but allow it to be implemented differently in subclasses. Suppose you're creating enemies for your game. You want all the enemies to have the ability to attack, but the method of attack varies depending on the enemy type. Using inheritance, you can treat all enemies as enemy objects in the broader system while still allowing each enemy to define its specialized behavior. This approach has several advantages. The base class centralizes the shared logic and it makes maintenance easier, while the subclasses allow you to customize and extend the functionality without modifying the base class. So use generics when you want the same functionality applied to various types, and it will always be implemented the same way. Use inheritance when you want to reuse the same functionality, but allow it to be implemented differently in subclasses. Now, perhaps that's an oversimplified way of thinking about it, because in fact, inheritance is a principle of object-oriented programming, whereas generics are a feature of the c -sharp language. And there are many times you're gonna to wanna to use both, and that's what we're gonna focus on for the rest of the video. When we start to combine generics with inheritance, we can build some really powerful and extensible systems. Suppose we're creating a generic spawner to spawn various types of enemies. We could use a generic base class for shared functionality. For example, all of the spawners are gonna to wanna to spawn things that are of type enemy, but you might need to inherit from the base class because you have enemies that require special treatment. Maybe these subclasses require additional methods, fields, or properties beyond what's common to all the spawners. These could easily be encapsulated in these subclasses. Just keep in mind that if the only reason you're using inheritance is to change behavior, consider using the strategy pattern instead of subclassing. In fact, we're going to implement all of those things right now as we refactor the loot system we looked at in the beginning. That original loot system was using an item class, and I'm going to keep that intact. I'm not going to touch that. Instead, I'm going to add an extra generic class here that I'm just going to call loot bag. And this is just going to be an abstraction around a collection of items that are going to be part of any loot drop. It doesn't need to be complicated right now. Let's have one method here, add item. This will just add something to the collection and log something out to the console. Then we could have maybe one more method here, get all items. That'll just return us the entire collection. Now we've got a nice way to define what we're going to drop. Let's implement the system that will actually handle the loot. Let's come over to the loot system file here. I mentioned using strategies to define behavior. In the code from the beginning of the video, there was a lot of if-else conditions to determine whether or not loot should be dropped at all. We can abstract that logic away using an interface, just as one method, should drop loot. 
Then we can implement the original logic as concrete implementations of this. One of them will just work off of drop chance. We'll keep a float for the drop chance and we'll pass that in through the constructor. Then we can just implement our should drop loop method as a check against random.value. Is it less than or equal to the drop chance? There was another type of condition as well, and that was based on environment. So we could have a different kind here to say whether or not we're in a dungeon or somewhere else. For now, let's just pass in a string that defines the environment type. Again, pass it in through the constructor. And then our should drop loop method can just be a conditional. For now, we'll just keep it extremely simple. We'll say a higher chance to drop loot if the string is dungeon. I'll just move those onto separate lines so it's a little more readable. So 80% chance to loot if it's dungeon, 40% otherwise. Okay, with that out of the way, let's start implementing the main system. Let's come back up to the top of this file. Here I'm going to define an abstract class, base loot dropper of type T resolver, where T resolver is one of our I loot resolvers. Now all of our loot droppers are going to have shared functionality. They're all going to need a reference to a loot bag so they know which items to drop, and they're all going to need a resolver. Let's create a protected constructor here so that we can take in that resolver. We'll set it, and then we can also just set our loot bag to be empty. Now, all of the loot droppers need to drop loot, and they all need to do one thing in common, and that is use the resolver to determine whether or not they should drop loot. So let's implement a method here, drop loot. Inside of here, we can have a conditional. We can check the strategy, which is our resolver, and determine whether or not we should drop loot. If we should, we're going to call another method. Otherwise, let's just debug something out to the console to say that there was something, some problem. This drop loot method has this same functionality for every loot dropper, no matter which type of resolver it uses. This way, our concrete versions can just override the on drop loot method with their own custom functionality. Let's add one more method here so that we can add items into the loot bag and just pass in items in one at a time. We can add a method for adding items in bulk later on. But for now, this is as far as we'll go with the base class. It's going to come back up to the top here so that we don't have to scroll. So here, let's begin with the enemy loot dropper. This class can inherit from base loot dropper of type I loot resolver. We'll give it a constructor that takes in a resolver and passes that through to the base. And we'll just have it log something out to the console so that we know it was called. Then we can override the on drop loot method with any custom functionality we want. For now, let's log something out to the console. We'll just put a note here about some future functionality. But for now, we'll just iterate over all the items in the loot bag and output them to the console. So as you can see, it's pretty straightforward. Let's continue and make one for chest loot drops. The constructor is going to be basically the same. The difference between these two concrete loot droppers will be in their actual functionality. So for now, we'll just do something very simple by logging something out. But in the future, as we develop this, we're going to add more functionality here. Let's log out all the items coming from this chest, and we're good. Now let's start implementing some patterns to make our labs a little bit easier. If we come back down into the base abstract class, we can create a builder here. This will make it really easy to set up our loot droppers as they get more and more complex. So let's keep a list of all the loot items we want to put into a dropper and also a reference to a resolver we're going to use. Then we'll have a reset method so that we can use the same builder for all of our loot drops. Here we'll set the resolver to null and we'll clear out the loot items list. Then we're going to return the builder itself so that we can chain the builder methods together. Then let's have a method that'll actually set our resolver and return the builder again. We'll do the exact same thing with all the loot items we want to put into this dropper. Again, just add all the items and return the builder. Then we need a generic build method where T is some type of base loot dropper of type I loot resolver. Let's have a null check here to make sure that we actually set a resolver for this particular dropper. If not, throw an exception. Now we can dynamically create the kind of dropper that we want using activator.create instance, which is going to be a type of T, plus we're going to pass in the resolver we want to use. Now, if there was any problem creating the dropper, let's throw an exception. Not much left to do now. Let's just add all of the items using the loot droppers add loot method. And to finish up, we just return the assembled dropper. Now, let's also create a factory so that we can inject it anywhere we need to drop loot. Let's keep this really simple as well. First of all, let's cache a version of the builder. Then let's come down and have a factory method that will create an enemy loot dropper where we can pass in any items and a drop chance. Here, let's reset our cached builder. Then we'll pass in the resolver that we want to use, pass in the loot items we want to use, and then we'll call the build method. 
Here we're explicitly telling the build method that we want an enemy loot dropper configured with all the options we just set. Let's go ahead and make a factory method for creating chest drops. Here, instead of a drop chance, we're going to pass in an environment type. Again, let's call the reset method, set the resolver type we want to use, set the items we want it to drop, and then call the build method, but this time build type chest loot dropper. Okay, how about we head back over to the original beginner code example. Instead of all the concrete methods and if-else statements, we'll replace it with this modular and extensible system. Basically, everything here will be replaced, but just so we have an idea of what it used to look like. Okay, now I'm going to wipe out everything except the start method. First of all, let's declare and initialize a loot dropper factory here. In the future, we'll probably inject this or get a reference to it from a service locator. Now, this script might be sitting on one of our enemies, so we want to create an enemy loot dropper, and we'd probably pass in a list of items that we've already determined. Here, I'll just make some up on the fly. Or maybe this is the mono behavior you've put on all your chest drops in your dungeon. Then we can just create a chest loot dropper. Same thing. And now when your player comes along and maybe defeats the enemy or opens the chest, all you have to do is get your dropper to drop the loot. So now we've looked at a very simple way of implementing inheritance alongside generics. But I want to touch on one more thing that makes generics so powerful. Specifically, generics give you the power to enforce stronger type safety. So we're going to make sure that our chest loot dropper works only with a specific type of resolver. This will give us cleaner code, cleaner intent, and better compile time guarantees. So now instead of accepting any iLoot resolver, this dropper is only going to accept chest specific resolvers. If we jump all the way down to the bottom of the file where I had the environment loot resolver, I'm just going to rename it to be the chest specific resolver. And why would we want to do that? Well, maybe we've got a new interface we want to implement. So maybe all the chest specific ones have the possibility of being locked. So maybe we want to introduce a new interface here. Maybe it's really simple. It could just have one property to say whether or not it's locked. And then our chest specific resolver can implement both interfaces, which means I now have to add a property. For now, without doing any implementation details, I'm just going to return false all the time. But our should drop loop method can now check to see if it's locked as well as the other conditions it needs to meet. Now, so far, that's fairly straightforward, but we're not facilitating this in the builder or the factory yet. Let's come over to the builder class. If we come and take a look at the build method itself, here we're not doing any type enforcement on the resolver. Let's change that. We'll update the build method to be of type T plus T resolver. So now T has to be of type base loot dropper, type T resolver, and T resolver has to be of type I loot resolver. That's a good start, but we can make it even more robust by having a type checker here. We can say if the resolver is not type T resolver, we can throw an exception here. Now, it would throw an exception anyway if we tried to create an instance with the wrong resolver type. But instead of waiting for that to happen, let's just program defensively. Then we can use the compatible resolver variable to pass in when we're creating the instance. And now, since the creation of our loot droppers is completely done in the factory, we just go over there and enforce our types. So over here, maybe we want to say that our enemy loot dropper can take in any type of I loot resolver, but our chest loot dropper, we for sure want to have the chest specific resolver every time or any type that derives from it. Okay, well, that was more than 10 minutes of straight code without ever trying anything out in Unity. So why don't we go press play? I'll hit play and we can have a little sanity check. All right, well, that's a lot of log statements there. Why don't I expand this panel just a little bit so we can see the whole thing. It starts by creating the enemy loot dropper and then adds two items to it, then creates the chest loot dropper, adds two items to it, and then it starts dropping loot. So the enemy drops both of its items and the chest dropped both of its items. So try to keep the main takeaways in the back of your mind as you build new systems for your game. Use generics to enforce types and when all the types have the same functions and behavior. Use inheritance when you want the types to use the same functions, but you want different behavior. And remember, if you're only changing behavior but don't need extra methods, fields, or properties, consider using the strategy pattern instead of inheritance. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Don't forget we've got a Discord if you want to discuss these kinds of topics with like-minded developers. And subscribe and hit the bell if you want to see a new video like this every Sunday. Hit the like button to feed the algorithm, and I'll put another video from the channel up on the screen similar to this one. Maybe I'll see you there.